Welcome everyone. My name's James Yatris. I'm CEO of BA365 and thank you for joining me today to discuss staying ahead of the crisis curve with COVID-19. Um, I suppose many of you have already been through a number of uh, response elements in terms of your initial response with COVID-19 and as an aviation industry we're fortunate in that we are prepared for various crises and we have airport emergency plans and so forth. So I would have expected many of you to be probably around this prepared space at, at a minimum in terms of your uh, current response um, for COVID-19. But we do have a, a slightly different um, situation in relation to responding to COVID-19 to what we typically look at for an emergency response or crisis response. But those elements that we have in place, essentially a banquet of capability, brings us to the point where we can utilise those to respond effectively and deal with this crisis and any other crisis, essentially. So staying ahead of the crisis curve, what do I mean by the crisis curve? In any crisis, it tends to feel in the initial stages, like hours go past in seconds. And it's a very rapid, ch evolving, changing landscape, and you're quite reactive. But the trick with, with staying ahead of a crisis is to not just focus on the now, but look into the future, the midterm and the long term. So staying ahead of the crisis curve requires you to take a forward looking approach to move from that reactive to proactive area and start looking at that future. So start thinking about what's coming now in the next days, weeks and months and start taking a risk-based approach in terms of identifying what comes next. So what are going to be the significant operational, financial, human, uh, impacts that we need to start thinking about and planning for now to address, to address the COVID-19 crisis and stay ahead of that curve. And if you can do that, it will give you time to have the appropriate resources, plans, um, procedures and so forth in place to deal with those things as they start to evolve. Now, what comes next is we're going to be facing multiple compounding threats. There, we are already seeing fear, uncertainty and doubt in the workplace and amongst staff. There's been changes to work for, workforce requirements. We're seeing people stood down, not only just in aviation, but across all industries and changes to salary arrangements. And those things create additional stresses. We also need to start to consider things like, uh, what are the supply chain disruptions? Um, skills shortages that we could experience within our organisations, um, changes to uh, financial operational impacts. So in taking a risk-based approach to that, have a think about uh, conducting a brainstorming session, doing some scenario planning, identifying these single points of failure, and then coming up with what is the most likely scenario for each of those, and what is your potential worst case and start planning for, for both. Um, with single points of failure, whether they be staff, uh, suppliers, contractors or third party dependencies, trust but verify. So if you haven't already started to question those organisations that support you that are critical to your operations and continued function, what they're doing in the COVID-19 response, how they're ensuring that they're able to continue operations effectively, safely and securely, then you need to have those discussions with them now and start their processes internally. Um, so, um, in terms of managing this response, the COVID-19 response is not a sprint. This is going to be a marathon. So we need to think about um, how we approach this, take a, a different um, approach to what normal crisis management, um, short-term responses would require. So some of the things to think about, are having the arrangements, your, 
and in place within your structure to reflect the size and circumstances of your particular airport. And moving from a crisis response to more of a crisis management slash monitoring function. One of the important things to do is to make sure that you establish your organisation as a credible source of regular communication. Keep staff close, maintain loyalty and trust. Um, so you can do things like publish regular health, operational, company updates, um, advisories, read and sign, keep people informed and engaged over time so that as um, they start to um, move back into a operational recovery phase, they haven't lost touch with your organisation and you still have that loyalty and trust. One of the other suggestions I'd like to make is to have a, a small either individual or team, your crisis team, downsize and maintain a watching brief. Maintain those situ situational reports within the organisation to identify um, any changes to um, operational or government policy and so forth, but streamline the, the identification, assessment and uh, response processes that you have in place. So they, they are uh, already to roll and taking that smorgasbord or banquet of capability and bringing in teams, processes, um, functions as required to deal with changes as they occur and as your planning process has identified that you need to do in the next coming months. Um, developing a depth in capability is probably also something that would be worthwhile. Given the extended nature of the response, you're probably gonna have some, uh, what I'd call crisis response fatigue set in. So having A, B and C teams in place, not only making sure that those individuals and functions are able to um, deal with a crisis in a fresh way and not get fatigued, but also if they're impacted directly themselves through quarantine measures, self-isolation and so forth, that they're available to respond as you need them to. So you have some depth in capability and background there as well. Um, in terms of some other thoughts around um, managing an extended response, um, we are a big industry, um, so make contacts with and partner with like-minded sized airports and share and collaborate. I certainly know from my background in the industry that when we were dealing with non-commercial areas such as safety and so forth, that there was strong collaboration across the industry. So tap into your networks, share ideas, share plans, um, your assessments and processes amongst yourselves and um, start to, to leverage that capability and work with some of your like-minded um, sized airports. Now one major consideration that I'd also like to flag um, is not only the fatigue in terms of dealing with the extended response, but the impact to individuals that we're likely to see as this crisis starts to evolve. So we're gonna see not only the stress that we've already exper all experienced with the changes to um, our uh, impact to our operational tempo, our working arrangements, working from home, a um, bit of isolation, all those stresses. But we're also likely to see some people within our organisations to start to have additional stresses due to family members who may get sick or who may get hospital, uh, may require hospitalisation. And in addition to that, um, how you're going to support and deal with staff who suffer loss as a result of COVID-19 is going to be stress, extremely stressful for those individuals. So have a bit of a think about, you know, making sure people are aware of what your EAP program is, how you identify those people who have suffered loss and can connect them with your EAP programs or suffering those types of stresses with family members or themselves becoming ill and how you identify that and uh, are able to bring in your organisational resources to assist those individuals. Now, in terms of our um, focus, we've gone through that initial response phase. Um, 
we're now into more of a monitoring and, and managing phase. But now is the time to start to think about all the elements involved in a recovery and return to operations. And you'll notice that in this particular slide, um, I've reflected one of the core tenets that I believe we need to consider, and that is not just how we bounce back, but having the taking the opportunity to look at how we can improve business processes, how we can improve our operations, how we can improve training, the way we work to not just bounce back, but to bounce forward. Now, key to that is, of course, keeping our staff engaged and productive. Um, but have a think about what can we do right now to take advantage of the reduced operational tempo. And that could be things like increasing training, um, engagement, reviewing standard operating procedures, re reviewing our operating procedures and processes, looking at how we can become more efficient, perhaps even locking in some of the changes to the business processes we're already forced to undertake as a result of this crisis and lock in those efficiencies, improvements and changes to work practices where they make sense and add value to the business going forward. Planning the return to operational tempo also raises some additional risks. We work in a highly safety sensitive and security sensitive environment. So starting to think about as we return to operational tempo, how do we make sure that we haven't lost the edge, that our staff haven't lost the edge in terms of their ability to return back to 110% efficiency and effectiveness that they were uh, prior to the crisis. So again, thinking about how you can use technology, systems and processes to deploy remote training and updates and communicate with your workforce, uh, maintaining those skills is going to be important. Key to that, I think, will also be factoring in some of the risks that you might face and identifying those right now as part of your return to operations and making sure that you have risk, appropriate risk mitigation strategies in place to deal with those key risk areas. Um, so looking at those opportunities, um, identifying improvements to business processes and coming back to that capability model where we're not just, we're agile as an organisation, we're not just bouncing back, but we're trying to bounce forward, I think is going to be key. And looking right across all our basic areas, uh, how we care for our staff, for our um, subcontractors, contractors, airport communities, how we protect our operations and our brand, making sure we manage the financial impacts and um, the compliance, safety, security risks, and then taking what we can out of this terrible situation and using that to identify improvements and lock those improvements into our business processes. So what I've tried to do is just capture a couple of key points um, in terms of staying ahead of the crisis curve, keeping our organisations resilient, uh, identifying processes for what comes next. So making sure we, we start to have that forward thinking process around the mid and long term. Um, what is our most likely risks and worst case scenario risks? Trusting, but verifying that those risks are being managed internally and externally where there are key dependencies. Making sure that we communicate with our workforce um, and we have the capability to support our internal and ex internal staff as they go through this crisis event. And we can protect our operation going forward um, as we return back to operations. So I've kept this deliberately short to allow some time for questions at this point. So over to the audience, do we have any questions? Okay, I've got a, um, uh, a question um, in terms of 
that's come up here. What's my expected length of the time for this crisis? Um, well, judging by the advice that the government's providing, we're in this for the long haul. Um, so we should be planning around a six, a minimum of six months um, for uh, the current situation. Um, the other question that I have is in terms of what sort of structure that we should have in place um, for your crisis management team. So that will depend on the size and scope of your organisation. Maintaining a watching brief could be as simple as having one person just keeping across um, the any announcements from government, collating that in the situation report and collating that with any operational um, statistics information that needs to go to management, publishing that on a daily or twice daily basis um, and decreasing in frequency as we get into more of a status quo uh, type environment. And then again, ramping that up as we get to a um, return to operations. So we start to keep people informed on terms of what's, what changes are being made and what's happening in the organisation and what can impact the organisation. Right, so in terms of um, how, another question that's come in, how might industry collaboration occur? Again, I think we already have significant networks uh, in place. I think um, just reaching out to your fellow colleagues that you already have established relationships is a starting point. There's probably an opportunity for more formal arrangements down the track, but I think certainly right now it makes sense to just touch base with your colleagues at similar sized airports, see what they're doing, get information from them, um, and uh, start sharing amongst yourselves. Um, as part of that, BA365, as I'm sure many of you are aware, are offering access to our software. It's a good piece of uh, kit for pushing out training um, and communications, read and sign and so forth. So if anyone has further questions on that, they can contact me directly. I believe there's a link on the AAA page on that. Any further questions? Great, all right. Well, I wish you all the best of luck in the coming weeks and months. Um, if anyone would like to uh, touch base with me offline, I'm more than happy to um, have uh, discussions with you and um, share anything else that I can. And uh, thanks for joining me today.